Hi everyone, welcome to Self Portraits Quarantine Edition. This is Eric March. I'll be your host today as we look at some self portraits throughout art history and talk about what self portraiture could mean and also get some tips on how to draw a head and draw your own head and set up yourself so that you can successfully draw your own self portrait. This lecture demonstration has been sponsored by Creative Arts Workshop. I'd like to thank them for for uh, sponsoring this. Uh, they're a great uh, creative creative arts organization here in New Haven, Connecticut, and they offer classes and other stuff. Um, we're all closed for quarantine, of course, but um, we're doing some online classes and things, so you can check that out at creativeartsworkshop.org. I want to begin our discussion today by looking at some self-portraits and talking about what self-portraits, all the different options that we have as artists with self-portraits and what some of those options might mean and what they might look like. Uh, we're starting here with Courbet's Desperate Man. This is a self-portrait when he was a, a little younger in his career. Uh, we can see it's very dramatic. <laughs> um, this was before he really found his way as a realist, so we got a little less drama uh, later on, but uh, he was making a name for himself and uh, certainly was using his self-portraits to, uh, to do that. So it's kind of a fun, fun portrait to look at. Very, uh, who knows, this, this may be what we're all feeling like right now as we stare at ourselves in the mirror. Um, we're also going to look at Rembrandt over here. This is uh, another self-portrait that Rembrandt did also early in his career. Uh, very different in tone, very different in layout, and we'll talk about the importance of the composition in a little bit. Uh, and our third one, and we'll look at more than three, but the, to start off with is Lovis Corinth, self-portrait with skeleton, um, reflecting again a kind of a thoughtfulness about mortality that we might might all be experiencing now. But let's let's take a look at. At this one first, and I want to, uh, the reason I want to look at three of them together is just to look at how how they're different um, and what those differences might mean in terms of the message or content of the portrait, and to give you just some ideas of the range of what's available for self portraits. If we look at the Corbet, we can see that he is really focusing in on his head and using his hands and his facial expression to really send a message here with, um, <laughs> with a certain kind of uh, desperate look and uh, dramatic scene here. Um, if we just look at head size as a mode of comparison with these three different self-portraits, uh, this one is, it, his head size is, is kind of the biggest in relationship to the, the frame of the piece. And what's interesting about that is when we have these kind of large, large heads, and it doesn't necessarily, the picture itself doesn't have to be necessarily physically large or physically life size, but what I'm talking about more, more now is the relationship of the size of the head to the frame. That puts us in some ways very close to him. The only way you know we would have a head that's like that big in our view is if we're really, um, you know, really right up close to another person to see their head kind of fill our view in the same way. And so it's a, uh, in some ways, it's uh, it's dramatic, but it's also intimate in that way, in that it's suggesting that we're close to this person and we're in in, in a close proximity to him as he tears his hair out and screams in horror or whatever whatever he's going to do here. Um, we can also see that the, the lighting is very dramatic too, but let's just stick with the head size as a, as a, as a comparison here. Um, and if we compare that with a Rembrandt, we can see that it's completely different. You know, we can barely see little Rembrandt back there. Um, the figure here is, is quite small, quite small in the room, also quite small in relationship 
to the edges of the picture. And we can see that canvas is just gigantic, you know. Um, as artists, we, we've all had these moments where the, uh, the canvas seems to be, uh, <laughs> be the dominant player in our studio. It's like, oh my God, what am I going to paint on this thing? Um, but it's just a really, really dramatic difference. You know, here, you know, it's all about him and his, you know, craziness. And here, it's about something else. You know, the, the relationship is much more about the, the challenge of art making, the, perhaps the, the moment of inspiration or the moment of beginning or the moment of stepping back from something. It could be any of these. We don't know because we don't see the, the front of the canvas, which is another choice that Rembrandt made to, to hide what's going on on the canvas so that we could perhaps um, read multiple meetings or that he as an artist could pack multiple meetings, meanings into this picture. Um, but whatever the case, Rembrandt here is not a heroic figure. Um, Rembrandt has a whole bunch of self-portraits. He's famous for his self-portraits and, and many of them are much more zoomed in than this one. This is kind of unusual in his body of work to have it so small. Uh, but you can see just by the size in relationship to the rectangle of the composition that uh, he's diminutive, less powerful, um, in some ways less important. The, the drama is really on the, on the canvas. Um, so it's a, it's a very different um, sentiment than the Courbet that we have over here. Also less dramatic. You know, he's kind of, he's not making any big, like, crazy movements back there. He's just kind of standing and, and looking either at us or at the canvas. Let's, let's take a look. Be looking at us as a visitor to the studio. Interesting. Let's take a look at Lovis Corinth here over here. Lovis Corinth is a, a German artist. You can see end of the end of the 19th century, end of the 20th. And Lovis Corinth is doing this picture. You know, the his head size, I would see it as kind of a, a comfortable distance from the viewer. Um, a, a conversational distance from us. Of course, he has his friend here, the skeleton. Um, so this isn't, uh, he's, not, he's not all alone here. He's got his, um, his handy uh, skeletal comparison here. Um, but we can see that he's, you know, in terms of the distance from the canvas, you know, his head is, you know, it's like if we were to be standing six feet from him and looking at him, you know, we, we would we would see about that much of him. Um, and uh, so, you know, three different, three different sizes of head or body in relationship to the rectangle. And, you know, they have, they each have a different kind of implication or sense. We can look at lighting too. Um, and these, the lighting, this would be, you know, um, you know very like bright, light, strong light and shadow cutting in from the side, creating these very, um, very clear kind of like light and shadow shapes you can see and very like, popping out the muscles on his arm and all this good stuff. Um, and that, you know, that definitely adds kind of like this theatrical uh, feeling to this and adds to the, the drama of the piece. You know, he's got his dark hair, like really framing his face like that really helping us focus in on those wild eyes in there. Um, and, you know, we can really see he's using this light and shadow to create these like, kind of really interesting kind of shapes. And you can definitely see it in the, the elbow up there. Um, compare that with a Rembrandt where uh, we do have dramatic lighting in parts of it. It's, you know, really like this, you know, really dark canvas, um, you know, it's really, really dark side of the room here, creating some pretty dramatic light and shadow over here. But in the portrait section, Rembrandt himself is kind of stuck in the shadows over there. Um, this is not over here. This is not not where the drama is happening. So there's a, a tension in some ways between our, you know, we really want to look where the drama, dr drama is, where the, the high contrast of light and shadow is, and that would really be the canvas. But of course, the figure always draws our eye and is always interested in looking at people. And so, you know, he's tucked back in here, but he's kind of 
secondary in some ways to whatever is happening on this canvas, which we don't know <laughs> what's happening on that canvas. Um, but it's certainly really something they were thinking about and looking at, you know, at this uh, the dramatic light over here. But he's, you know, he's a little, this is a, a humbler portrait of him. Uh, this is, you know, I'm the main event. Rembrandt is uh, not, not quite making that statement in the same way. Um, it's a little bit more about kind of the artistic process. Another thing to note here in terms of uh, proximity, you know, we talked about the Courbet being kind of close. Um, certainly in the Rembrandt, he's far. You know, we actually see space on the floor. Um, and we see space in the studio, like there is lots of space here. We know we're at least, you know, 10 feet from him because we can see the floor. We could like step on that floor until we get to him. Um, and he's also surrounded by space. You know, the, the Courbet, he's, he's kind of pressed in by the edge of the canvas here. Uh, kind of, you know, he's like, God, I'm like a caged animal, you know, like kind of stuck in here. Not the same with Rembrandt. He's got, he's got room to move around. Our eye has room to move around. But these nice kind of quiet passages, beautiful like transitions of light um, across the wall and you know this glowing puddle of light on the floor here. Um, so again, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't have this feeling of being so closed in. There's room to breathe, there's room to think, there's room to you know, walk back and forth between the artist and the canvas. Let's look at what's going on with the light over here. So this portrait is kind of unusual because um, for the most part, it's backlit. Um, the strongest light is coming from outside. And that's putting Lovis over here in, in silhouette, more or less. Um, and that's kind of unusual for a portrait because oftentimes when we have backlit, it's kind of hard to see the features because they're, they're backlit. Um, but Lovis is, you know, talking Lovis like he's my buddy. Hey, Lovis, Mr. Corinth, um, has, uh, has uh, found a way around that um, by providing a secondary light source. So he has the primary light source, which is the outside sky. The secondary light source would be, you can see this, you know, warm glow on his head. So he's probably got some lantern or, you know, lamp or something, whatever they had in 1896, gas lighting or something. Anyway, some warmish light that's lighting him up. And so we can easily see all of his features and everything. That's that's not a problem because he has a secondary light source. And it's kind of nice. We've got this cool light, you know, cool light coming from the back. And then we have this um, warm, warm light on his head, which, you know, he's got a cool shirt over here, but he's got a little warm over there. You see that? Um, I'm kind of alternating between warm and cool with this. Looks like, actually, I take that back. Maybe the light's coming from here. You see that kind of underglow on him? Kind of coming up like that. Maybe that's where it's coming from. I don't know. I'm seeing this over here. Um, uh, but even still, that, that, that lantern light on him or the gas light, light on him is, is not as strong as the light coming from outside. This is almost white, you can see. In the in the sky, there's a very strong backlit. Um, that's kind of an unusual way, an unusual lighting for a self-portrait, um, or for any portrait actually, to have it backlit like that. It's kind of interesting. There's very strong shapes um, with these uh, this almost uh, profile over here. It's kind of interesting. Um, kind of pops out. You can see these really interesting shapes that are kind of made in this grid of the window, you know, kind of between him and the grid. It's kind of a fun shape game going on there, this thing. The skeleton. Look at that shape it finds in there. The skeleton. You see that? The shape right in here. It's kind of cool. Neat shape in there. Um, but what's also interesting about this is that we do have the outside. Like we've got these little buildings and stuff out in the background. Um, and that too is something that we haven't seen, you know, in these other two. This definitely evokes you know the city that he's living in the where his studio is what kind of windows he has in his studio um, we're invited to kind of like you know look around here and notice these buildings and think about the weather and you know a little smokestack and everything um, 
And so this, you know, it says a message about him. Like he is an artist, but he is an artist in a certain context, in a certain city. And that's important enough to include in this self-portrait. Let's take a look at some more. So this is Kathy Kowitz, one of my favorites. Love her. This is kind of nice because we can see, um, we can. She, she's uh, known for her um, graphic work. She's a printmaker for the most part, printmaker and sculptor. And so we can see the line work. The others are paintings, of course. And if we're talking about drawing, you know, it's nice to kind of see how she does her hatching and everything. But um, <laughs> And this is another one where we can really see, you know, the format. Um, you know, she also is really hemmed in here by the rectangle. There is not a lot of room to move around in here. It's really close in. You know, this is definitely like, ooh, I've had a bad day. She, um, you know, she was living in Germany in the first half of the 20th century, so... She she probably had plenty of those kinds of days. It was not easy. She lost a, I think she lost a, a son to World War One and a grandson to World War Two. So it was, she was not a fan of the war. Um, um, and you can see here, you know, in in this case, the light is coming from kind of coming from above, right? So. It's really clear, like we have, you know, paper left here, and then more and more hatching, more and more hatching, coming this way, coming this way, and on and on and down and down and down. So we have this kind of transition of light to dark or darker um, as it kind of comes down her face, lighting up her nose there. Um, so this is, you know, kind of has to do with that egg idea of an egg kind of lit from above. Would get darker and darker and darker and darker and darker as it goes down. Um, she is such. She, she, she's also one that is known for her self portraits. Um, I guess all of these are. Corbet is known for his self portraits. Rembrandt is known for her self portraits. Lovis Corinth, I think, did a self portrait every uh, every year on his birthday or something like that. Um, and Kathy Colwitz is also known for her self portraits. She's got a lot of these um, really evocative self-portraits really um, insightful into kind of her character and what she was thinking about and definitely check her out if you haven't and then we have some other ways of doing self-portraits here's uh, Adolf Menzel another German artist he uh, <laughs> this is one of the most famous paintings of feet um, that you might ever see uh, but uh, he did a couple of these. He did a couple of feet. He did a couple of hands. And these are self-portraits. It's a completely different concept for a self-portrait. Um, a self-portrait that, you know, what, what, what can we see? You know, what, what does my body look like? Um, and really giving a good study. You know, this is not a quick painting necessarily. Probably worked on this a couple of sessions. He had to hold his toe out um, like that, which is not easy to do. I don't know how he did that. Um, maybe he would propped it against a book or something um, but you can see like his style is very you know we, we this is a pretty tough look at one's feet you know you can see how the you know his feet are all kind of banged up and whatever stuffed into boots or you know like veins and you know wrinkly and everything you know this is not some angelic foot you know and that that says something about him and what he's interested in and he was somebody who drew all kinds of things I mean he would draw a rat in a sewer and he would draw like the the crown prince you know like he covered the gamut and he was always always drawing um so he's one to check out too but he, he did this great painting of this foot there's this you know it's like what do we can get out of a foot there's kind of a, a proudness to that toe you know and there's this kind of idea of this this painting kind of continuing up kind of right into our <laughs> right into us with that leg um and uh yeah, there's kind of like a, a heroic quality to this foot, which in, you know we often foot are often overlooked as unimportant. But uh, give it to Menzel to make something out of a foot. I mean, it really, really can. Continuing that idea, we have a more contemporary artist, uh, Joan Semmel. Uh, this self-portrait, 
and she actually did many of these self-portraits where it's kind of kind of what you can see of yourself or of herself um, without a mirror. So these views of her kind of looking down her body and and throughout her her career, she she's done many of these. Um, some some just her, some with her partner, like kind of both lying down and kind of what do we look like? And and this is another one, you know, Joan. You know, this is not an idealized depiction. You know, she's kind of taking a real hard look at herself and saying, okay, what do I got here? And 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 how do I, you know, this is me, and I'm this is me and how I can see myself. And this is you know painting without even a mirror necessarily like what what can I see of myself and then you know and then of course she's 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 putting it in a rectangle and and that is you know she's composing with these these shapes you know that shape is important this shape is important you know this shape is important all these you know it's not it's not just a random look she's you know crafting a, comp a composition based on this subject, these shapes. Um, interesting piece of color there too. Or she, she has many different you know, color treatments of, of, of this subject. Um, and there's also kind of a proudness to it. You know, it's like, yeah, this is me. You know, I don't need to, I don't need to hide this um, kind of frankness about her own, her own body. Um, a couple more I want to look at here. This one is uh, Lauren Redness, and she's a contemporary artist, obviously. And I saw her work at uh, New York City Ballet. She had a, this great big show that just closed, I think. Uh, it was in February that I saw it, and it, she did a, a portraits of 100 people of who are all like in the New York City Ballet um, organization. So everybody from like the security guy to like somebody who's working on sets to the dancers to like the administration people and all this. So this isn't necessarily a self portrait. I think this is a picture of somebody, you know, in Lincoln Center. Um, but, but I kind of liked them. I thought, you know, it was kind of like a real contemporary look. You can see that it's very flat, you know, her backgrounds are entirely flat. I think she did some of this digitally. Um, some of this was like drawn, but then, you know, this, this looks like a digital background here. Um, uh, and you know, very, very, uh, you know, like the the forms are very flat, and that's you know something else we could talk about with these is you know very there's like a lot of form information in these earlier ones. Um, you know, we you know we can really see the the light and shadow, and it's very clear what the forms are. You know, look at this hand; it's a wonderful hand. Look at that, uh, really, really neat. Um, but you look at the redness, and you know she's. Uh, much flatter, you know, a little bit of form information like the nose is coming out and you know There's a little bit of shadow here and stuff like that But for the most part, it's very kind of patterny oriented like you look at the hair. This doesn't feel like form You know, this is like a, a flat design um, So it's a it's an entirely different look uh, I kind of like it. it feels very fresh. It feels very um, contemporary um, Here's another one. This is by my friend Brooks Frederick who's a wonderful painter. You can check him out uh, right there find him on Instagram um, but uh, so he recently did this portrait he had a model who uh, who posed on zoom and we're all on zoom these days um, and uh, so this is very recent this is like fresh you know uh, but I thought this was a like, great concept it was like very like zeitgeist like very of the moment it's like why not do a painting of like <laughs> like what we're doing right now so, like looking at looking at zoom um, so this isn't a self-portrait either necessarily but I could you know but I really appreciate uh, that he's, you know, I just appreciate the concept of, again, kind of taking a look at what we're looking at today and and what is my day like, you know, and, and doing a painting of it. Um, so this is a quicker one, you know, I don't know, I spent maybe an hour or two on it, something like that. I think the model posed for an hour. Um, you know, she posed on Zoom, which is kind of a cool idea too. Um, but, uh, but again, like a couple, you know, like, well, why not? Like we could put our portrait like in a computer screen. Like God knows we've got all of our faces in these devices. Um, just like take it for what it is and go with it, you know. Um, but uh, recently, I visited with Brooks, and he turned me onto this painter named Emil Carlson, who's a wonderful still life painter. Um, just absolutely gorgeous paintings. I, I. Uh, stunned by them there's a there's a website of his work that's like it's catalog raisonnet it's got some really nice um uh, plates of his his work online you can check it out but 
in his, we can see that his self-portrait is kind of tucked right in there in that um, reflection there, which is kind of a cool idea. But, you know, even if we go, you know, even if we don't do a reflection, it's, it's another concept, you know, like, can we make a self-portrait that is, you know, tells the story through objects? Is that, is that a way that we can express ourselves? Like, that not, doesn't even have the figure that um, is, a, is a collection of things that are important to us or a collection of, like, objects that we own or objects that we wear or, you know, objects that are in our house and we are now all in our houses all the time. So, like, are we defined by our furniture and environment and stuff like that? Is, like, is like how much of our environment is an extension of ourselves um, or evidence of ourselves? I included a couple of photos, <laughs> photos here of myself. This I put up on Instagram. It's kind of silly, of course, but um, it's just another concept, you know. Like, uh, uh, maybe we're drawing ourselves with like uh, all the gear on, like all the, you know, anti-coronavirus uh, stuff on. You know, again, how much of our self-portrait is going to be, you know, some sort of reflection of like some exact moment in time, or. Uh, or are we going for something that's a little broader, a little bit more general, that captures um, an, an essence that's a little less connected with uh, particular moments? But you know, uh, <laughs> this is me and my family here. This is these are my roommates in quarantine, um, and uh, you know that that's another thing. Like uh, your self-portrait could be you and others. Um, you can think of like the great Las Meninas by Velasquez, where. It's a very grand self-portrait, lots of people in it, um, but it is a self-portrait somewhere. Uh, so that could be another idea. You know, is it is it me? Is it me with um, me with a skeleton? Uh, me with a canvas? You know, me tearing my hair out. You know, these are all all different ideas that we can pursue and think about and decide. You know, what is the story? That my self-portrait is gonna is gonna tell. So some things to think about when you're doing your self-portrait. One is the the format. You know, this would be like, kind of like the design. How big is my head in relationship to the rectangle? Um, where's my head gonna be? Where am I gonna be in the picture? What size is it gonna be? Lighting. These are all these are in, in necessarily in particular order. Um, you know, am I going to have dramatic lighting? Am I going to have kind of softer lighting? Am I going to have natural lighting? Am I going to be backlit? Am I going to have like artificial light? You know, what's my lighting going to be? Where's it going to come from? What's the direction that it's going to come from? Expression. If we're doing a head, there we go. Um, are we going to have like a wild like staring? Are we going to be looking out at the person? Are we going to be looking away? Like all of these, the heads we see are looking out, but they don't have to be. You know, they could be looking away. They could be looking down. They could be looking up. You know, I don't know. The environment. What's going to be included? You know, am I going to include the studio? Am I going to include a window? Am I, you know, Am I drawing just the inside of my house? Like, is it all environment? My, my laptop, my stuff, like, uh, no neutral, you know, neutral background, no environment. What am I going to include? Um, you might think about symbols. You know, obviously, you know, the skeleton over here could be a symbol. It could be just like, hey, this is, you know, I have a skeleton in my studio to draw from and learn about human anatomy but you know if you're putting a skeleton in with your self-portrait like it means something um you hear you know that easel means something here i don't know maybe it's hair i don't know um or no or no no props you know i think of frida Kahlo. she was big on symbols and self-portraits um other people right those part of your self-portrait? Are you going to do like me and my family kind of thing? Are you going to do me and my lover, me and my 
kid, like me and my neighbor or me and my students, you know, there's some um, uh, famous paintings of like, you know, artists and, and their students. I'm thinking about that great one in the mat. Um, or uh, objects, you know. What, what I'm going to include, objects, there we go, um, that might tell the story. Or, or is it all objects? Is it a self-portrait through still life uh, instead, of a, instead of through a face? So those are all things to think about um, when you're essentially conceptualizing. And you may actually, when you're doing this kind of conceptualization process, um, you may do it, you know, you know, small, like we do like these little uh, thumbnail sketches or something, you know, not much bigger than like two inches by three inches, maybe even smaller. Um, and just like banging out a bunch of ideas, you know, so maybe I've, you know, maybe I've got a big mirror in my bathroom, say. And so I want to do like, Maybe it's the only mirror I have in my house, so why not? So I'm gonna do like me in my bathroom, okay? So that might be one concept. I'm like, well, let's see, how do I, how big do I want it? You know, what do I wanna trim it? Uh, do I wanna include, you know, do I want the portrait in the bathroom, you know, to, uh, to have the toilet and like my rubber ducky on there? And so like the, like the like the image part of like the the head part of it is just like a small detail kind of like the emil carlson over here like you know the, the portrait is just like a teeny part of it like is you know am i am i just like one person in a whole environment and and i'm kind of um humble in that you know like oh yeah i'm just just one thing in a in a larger situation or is it you know it's a mirror in my bathroom and I'm kind of making myself as big as I can be in the canvas while still indicating that it's the bathroom mirror. You know, that would be like, this would be one, one concept. This would be a second concept. Maybe a third concept is, you know, I've got the mirror in my bathroom just, just because it's the mirror in my bathroom. I don't want to tell anybody that it's in my bathroom, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I'm just going to like draw my head. Um, and just use the mirror in the bathroom as a mirror and nothing else. And it's not important that it's in the bathroom and all that. So, you know, these are the same mirror, same situation. Maybe the light's coming through like the bathroom window over here. So we're getting, you know, shadow on this side. Um, like same situation, but three different takes, three different messages uh, about well, what this kind of picture it could or, or is about. And, you know, and, and, you know, there's a relationship between form and message too. You know, maybe I, Maybe I really like this idea of the design um, and I kind of follow it through because I, I like the design idea and, and kind of only later do I understand what it means. Um, so doing these quick sketches is a really easy way of kind of looking at your ideas, getting them out there without having to set too much stuff up. Obviously, I'm just like doing this out of my head, like knowing what my bathroom looks like. <laughs> That's about it. Um, but I can see very clearly like of these three, you know, this is probably like the least interesting for me right now. Um, like I kind of like this idea, maybe the sink and maybe this, like depending on like, like we might be getting some nice light in the bathroom or something. Um, so like, you know, maybe, maybe I'm going to go with this. Um, and then I could, you know, take a look at this scene during the day when the lights coming through the window with the lights off. Maybe I could take a look right now at night. Um, you know, I think I have, I have lights like up here on the window in my bathroom or something like that, you know, and then I'd get, Maybe I actually with those lights, I would get like flat light. Maybe it's uh, maybe the light and I have a, a door over here. So maybe I turn off all the lights in the bathroom at night and I get like this weird, like dark side light and it's kind of spooky and nighttimey. And that's like what you would see if you like woke up at 3 a.m. and like went to the bathroom or something. Um, so those are all like, you know, same environment, uh, different crops um, and different. Uh, maybe potentially different lighting concepts for for that. And so you could, you know, if you have an idea, you're like, yeah, I think I want to, you know, use this situation. Um, but, you know, do some sketches, look at it, look at yourself, you know, and, and kind of give yourself some options and you know, be creative and kind of see what what's going to work um, or what's, you know, what's most interesting. So all that being said, let's take a look at um, some ideas to think about when you're drawing heads. And I have some heads over here that I, we're gonna look at, and then I have like a bigger image too. And this, 
this will have to do with uh, lighting as well as design a little bit. All right, so this is like my um, serial killer shot over here. And this is serial killer to the side. This is what happens when you have a, a desk light <laughs> shining straight at you. Your pupils dilate, which makes you look kind of weird. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, but one thing I wanted to note here in terms of proportion, so this is like a straight on shot, right? Um, we have a little, you know, lights coming from the side, but it's, you know, so we get kind of like this three quarter light. And we can think of the head very simply as an egg, like an egg shape from the front. Um, it's widest here. So what it's not is it's not an oval, widest on the middle. Okay, the widest part of our cranium anyway, it's right about there. And you can see, um, you can see that my hair kind of puffs out there and your hair will kind of puff out here. Now my hair is also puffing out here, but that's because my hair is always sticking up all over the place. Um, if you have your hair kind of pulled tight back, you know, if you have longer hair kind of pulled back in a blend, you'll see that the widest part is here. Um, it may be in line with your ears, but your ears, of course, aren't your skull. So we're talking about the skull here and hair over skull, but the widest part is up there. So just watch that. Um, sometimes, you know, the cheekbones come out a good distance too, um, but usually the widest part from the front of our skull is here. So keep that in mind when you're going. And then of course, from there, it's, you know, it gets narrower and narrower into the chin. Um, another thing to keep in mind when you're drawing is if you are looking at a head straight on, it's hard to believe, but the eyes are actually halfway. So if I take a measurement from the tip top of my head, hang on one second, at the top of my head, it's a little hard to see, is right about there. Um, if I take a measure from the top of my head, and this is like top of the hair, top of the head is usually like pretty close to my eyes. And I compare that with from my eyes to my chin. You see that it's like exactly halfway and it will be exactly halfway on almost all of us. Um, uh, unless you have like really, really big puffy hair, uh, it'll be you know close to halfway for those eyes. So do make sure a very common mistake is to put the eyes um, too high. If we actually look at the lower redness up here, you see that? She's got the eyes way up here. Um, the reason people do that a lot, I mean, Lauren is doing it for a stylistic reason, um, but I'm assuming, <laughs> um, is that, you know, what part of the face do we, uh, do we interact with the most? Um, it's this part, right? So we've got the eyes, the mouth, you know, so that part grows in importance in our imagination and then also in size too, when we draw it. Um, so if you're gonna draw a head, you know, be aware that the tendency may be to make this part of the face bigger than it actually is. In this case with Lauren, um, we get that kind of like weird stylization, you know, like the, the forehead is like too small, like her, her brain is like small in there um, physically, but it's a stylistic thing and, we, and we, we go with it because again, she's got the most important part which is this, um, and you know, she, so she's using that stylization on purpose. Um, but if you're going for a more like straight on realistic portrait, you do wanna check your measurements to make sure that you're not kind of falling into that uh, thing where you're, you're making the part that you look at the most actually bigger than it actually is. You know, in here we have, all, we, we, need, we have like gray matter, we gotta, we gotta, uh, well, most of us do, I, I don't know, a little bit of it. Um, we, you know, we gotta accommodate that. And so make sure you leave room for the brain in there. And that's the cranium that's in there. Um, if you wanna think about the skull from the side, you can look at Lovis Corinth there with his skull. Um, this is all like brain in here. Um, and our eyes are just about halfway in there. Um, and all this is brain. The bottom of the cranium this is, is about in line with your nose, believe it or not. The bottom of your nose. So we can think of like, from the front anyway, like all this being cranium. And of course the jaw hanging off of that, that down, down like that. So we can start with the egg shape. Um, we can think about this almost being a circle. And then start finding the jaw in there. So it's a it's a little flat on the sides. You can 
stick your hands on your sides like um, McCam McCulkin, whatever his name is, in Home Alone. Um, you can feel like the flat part of the side of your head. So it's not, again, it's not an oval. Um, it's a little flat on the sides from the front. Top of the head, there's a point on the top of our head. Um, you don't have to be Mork and Mindy. Like, we all got it. There's a high point. And even with your, all your hair on, you know, you know the, the highest point of your hair is right in the middle there. Um, so, so do be aware of that. Don't give yourself a flat head. Um, um, don't, and no, don't make it too pointed either. <laughs> you know, uh, you know it's, uh, but it does come to a slight rise there, even with all the hair. And if you have a you know, big puffy hair, the highest point of the hair is going to be right there. So do, do, do note that. Um, then we got ears. Fun thing about ears, we look at ears. Ears often, ears get a lot of, you get short shrift. Um, ears are bigger than people think they are. Um, if we take a look at the size of that ear on me over here, you know that ear is about as big as like from the bottom of my nose to the top of my eye, you know? Um, so oftentimes what, what artists think of the, the ear as being is roughly between the same height as between the nose and the brow. It's about like average ear, ear height. And usually about average ear placement too. If your head's tipped up slightly or tipped down slightly, you'll get um, that ear a little higher, a little lower. But we can see it here too. You know, mine's 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 a little smaller than than like average, which would be like bottom of the nose to somewhere on the brow. But you get the idea. Just don't make it too small. You know, people are like, oh, I don't like my ears, or whatever. But like, they'll just look weirder if you make them too small. So don't make them too small. Um, so we're off to a good start here, right? We've got an egg. What more do we need? Eyes, maybe? But before we do eyes, um, take a, another look at this form. You know, if you're starting this way, where you've got kind of a rough egg form, look at the um, kind of the specific shape. You know, spend some time getting the shape of your particular head and hair uh, right. Don't make it generic. You know, really look. Are you, you know, I'm like this. We got... Silas over here, he's got, you know, this nice kind of pointy chin here. Um, Lynn, can't, you know, see her whole head, but like, you know, her shape is a little different. Sawyer, he's like, he's, he's a kid, you know, he's like four years old. So his, 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 um, you know, relationships, he's a little weird in the camera too, but like, you know, his, his cranium is going to be big in relationship to like his face. Same with Silas, he's, he's seven. Um, you know, so that relationship is going to be a little different for kids. Um, but, you know, take a look at yourself. Like, what do you look like? What is your weird head shape? And you can see that I'm kind of blocking it out in these kind of straight lines, too. Um, I do that a lot um, to keep myself honest so I don't make everything too much like a piece of a circle. Like, none of this is a piece of a circle except for maybe my eyes, um, which are in here. They're ellipses. So let's take a look at the side view. It's a little hard to see, so I'm going to outline this a little bit. Uh, but you can see again, you know, this kind of, you know, see what I'm outlining, this way of outlining. You know, I might start with a pretty loose egg shape, giving myself a little bit more width this time because I'm seeing some of the side view. You know, we're wider from the side. We're wider from the side than we are from the front. Um, so, you know, this would be where that cranium is in there. Jaw coming in something like that but then I'm looking you know like I'm looking at you know head and hair all together for this first go around of a, of a head shape tuck it back in there for the ear throw your neck in don't throw your back out but throw your neck in and get yourself going here there's the neck again you know but again really important measurements are the relationship between uh, height and width, all right? It's really easy to measure, you know, just like take a, take a measurement, um, you know, of the width and compare it to the height. You know, how many times is this width? So this is a square of the width, you know, and this is like from the side to the, to the ear. Um, it's like one, like one and a half. So if I do the same thing here, Take the width 
I want to make sure that the width of my drawing is like one and a half. You know, I could maybe make this just a little, just a little slimmer to make that ratio work. Um, we would want to do the same thing here. Measuring, measuring yourself is a little tricky. Um, when you're, uh, when you're measuring yourself, you know, if you're in a mirror, you want to like, you know, sometimes we like measure on our pencils and close one eye, but like, when I do that, like I totally block my whole head and it's like impossible to see. Um, so it, it can be a little tricky. Sometimes I actually measure, you know, like if I have a mirror that's close enough, I measure on the mirror, like, like measure the distances on the mirror. Sometimes I just measure myself physically and I do my measurements like on my physical face because I know that's going to work. All right. So. You know, usually when we're measuring objects away from us, we just, we can do this and we can like check the width, the height and all that. But um, here I actually do it physically if I'm, you know, if I can see myself physically. And of course, if you're drawing yourself from a photograph or drawing somebody else from a photograph, um, you can just measure on the photograph itself to remind yourself of those proportions. But that's a really, really important thing to get and to get, to get early in the drawing um, so that you're not, uh, you know, you're not monkeying around with it and getting confused. Or like trying to you know throw in all like your nostrils and your eyeballs and everything and um you don't you know like you don't even have like the overall shape right next step would be looking at where your center line is so the center line is you know what exactly what it sounds like going down the middle of your face just like that all right here to the side you can see that just by throwing in that center line it changes the orientation of my egg from straight on like without that center line let's say i got rid of that center line like i just had this shape it's like i don't know i don't know if this is i just have a weird head or if it's a head in rotation but as soon as i put in that center line it's like oh yeah okay so this is like i'm seeing a little bit more of the cranium over the side here and this is middle you know this is straight on just, like, you know, just that center line can be really important next step might be to to find your hairline you know where the hair starts and to block in the shape of your hair. You notice that I'm not going for the features right away, okay? I'm kind of setting the table before I uh, serve the dinner. I want to make sure I know where those features are supposed to go before I draw them in. Like the features are what everybody wants to jump into, but um, you could end up with some pretty screwy proportions and a and a portrait that does not look like you um, very easily if you uh, if you don't get the overall proportions right. Sometimes even at this stage, I give myself a slight um, tone here just to help separate out the hair shape from the head or from the face, so I can just see it a little bit more clearly. Um, if you're, you know, looking straight on, make sure that you're, you're giving yourself enough hair. That's another thing people kind of like, um, you know, really scrimp on the hair. And I don't want to dog on like Lauren Redness. I actually love her work, but it's just a good example of what I'm talking about. Oops. Uh, but just make sure you're giving yourself enough hair. Same deal, you know, like uh, make sure, you know, like there's all this cranium, like hair is like, you know, up here. Um, sometimes we, you know, we can roughly divide the head into to thirds, like top of the head. Um, the next third might be the, the eyebrows, and then the next third might be the nose and the chin. And that actually, that, that holds up pretty well. Let's see how it goes on me here. So this is my bottom third, chin to nose, nose to brow, not quite, my brows are a little smaller, brow to top of the head. So I'm not quite thirds here, um, but you can, you get the idea. It's kind of like it's a good rule of thirds that kind of keep in mind. Um, check on yourself. Are you perfect thirds, you know, here to the top of your head? Or are you um, like what I am? I'm like imperfect thirds, you know. Um, you know, my, my, this, the middle section is a little shorter than a third. But if I take the, the chin to nose, that is actually one third, you know. So if I divide this whole thing oops, into thirds, You know, I'm like, oh, boom, there we go. I got the nose, at least. Um, probably similar thing over here. Nose probably needs to be a little lower. But then I have to make sure, you know, because I did this check, my brow, brow hair is going to be a little lower. 
than that third mark. And then we get the freebie. So once we get this in, I, you know, again, these are like very light marks just to set some of these bigger proportions before I go in with any, any detail at all. But then the freebie, of course, is middle, okay? Halfway between top and bottom is where our eyes are. If we're looking at ourselves straight on, if we're looking at ourselves, you know, tilted up or tilted down, um, you know, if we're like this, this much is gonna be much bigger than this much. And if we're looking down, you know, this much is gonna be much bigger than this. If we're looking straight on, this and this are gonna be the same. Uh, uh, almost everybody. It's very, very um, consistent on, on, on almost everybody. So let's take a look. So, um, so I'm going with just like, just tick marks here. And the reason I'm going with just tick marks is that <laughs> it's a lot easier to erase a little tick mark than it is to like draw in a, you know, a nose and like, I love this nose and it's perfect. And oh my gosh, I'm such a good artist. I could draw this nose totally awesome. And then I like step back and it's like, oh, whoa, that nose is actually way too big, you know? And then I have to go back in and, and erase all my wonderful work. Um, so tick marks, light marks to start um, is a good idea. Uh, I certainly screw up a lot. So, you know, that's uh, okay. But, it would make your life easy and um, <laughs> make light marks in the beginning. Um, and once we get those marks in, you know, we can, we can do eyes. You can kind of find where eyes are. You know, make sure you give enough space between the eyes. That's really important. You don't want to pinch your eyes or else you just look funny. Nobody wants to look funny in their own self-portrait. Um, and then we can look at, you know, the distance between top and bottom, like maybe this is top lid, and this is the tuck of the top lid. Maybe this is the thickness of the eyebrow. And again, we can do all this with like little tick marks um, to keep ourselves on, on track here. And the same thing with the lips, you know, where's the, you know, where's the philtrum, that's that little thing, like what's, what's half, halfway is usually about there. Um, I think that's about halfway on me too. So I know like, okay, all the lips have to go up here, but I want to make sure I have enough filtrum. Like little, little, little tick, little tick marks. Um, do give yourself enough of the lower jaw, like nose to, to chin. It's another thing that happens a lot. You get, um, you know, we get like big eyes way up here. Nose, everybody's like, oh, I don't know how to draw a nose. Um, big mouth, because we all like smiling. And then like chin is like, me, 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 like way in the bottom. Like, yeah, give yourself enough chin. It's like, you know, it's a full third of this distance, if not more. So make sure you, and again, a little tick mark for the, the tuck of the chin, finding where the lips are. I want to get rid of this, this gigantic nose. That's not that's not right. Um, when, you're, when you're drawing somebody or drawing yourself from three quarters, another good thing to look at is like the distance between the edges and other major landmarks. Um, you know, I have to fit all this stuff in. You know, all this stuff of like the half of my face is turning away. Um, that all needs to get in here. So if I, you know, if I pull that nose out too close to the edge, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose a whole bunch of my cheek. So look for these shapes to help yourself figure out you know, where things kind of start and end. And also just to figure out where the center line is itself. Like, where is that thing? You know, it's a lot closer to the left side than it is to the right side. We're almost over. We haven't even gotten started yet. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to do this again sometime. Like part two. Um, also be aware if you're doing like a three quarter view that, you know, this, all the stuff on this side is going to be a different shape than the stuff on this side. If you look at my lips, you know, like this shape is just different than that shape. If I make it my lips in three quarter view look like my lips in front view, like that are symmetrical it's gonna look weird. It's gonna look like I'm like twisting my lips or something. So do make sure if you're doing something that's like not quite, you know, 
like front on, you're gonna, it's not gonna be symmetrical anymore. And in fact, front on is not even necessarily gonna be symmetrical either. Um, I was looking at some of Sargent, these great like Sargent, uh, <laughs> there's me, um, this great Sargent show at the, the Morgan of a bunch of his charcoal portraits and almost every single one, like the left half and the right half were different. Like he's like one eye was a little saggier than the other, the lips were twisted a little bit. I just thought it was so interesting that he kind of found those asymmetries and like those asymmetries gave the character. So, you know, look for symmetry and you definitely want to pay close attention to symmetry to make sure things are lining up on either side of that center line. Um, but then, you know, once you've gotten that far and you, you know, you've gotten it pretty good and you're, you're happy with it and ask yourself, huh, like, how am I asymmetrical? And some of us may know the answer to that very, very well. Like my sister is very aware of her asymmetrical nose, for instance. Um, but, uh, but, you know, again, like this is an opportunity to really look at yourself, really understand who you are, like what do you look like and where are you asymmetrical? Like what parts of your, your face, what parts of your um, physiognomy, like give yourself the character of you? Um, and, and what does that express? And, and how in our decisions of format, you know, are we, are we what are we communicating in those decisions of format? Um, Self-portraits are really interesting. Uh, fun projects. You can do a lot of them. I think Lovis Corinth over there, he did, he did like a, like a self-portrait every year on his birthday, which I think is a wonderful idea. Um, but, uh, you know, as a result, he had, he had a lot of self-portraits. Um, but like, yeah, it's not a bad idea. You know, we can all do them uh, to some degree, right? And uh, we kind of make a little chart of ourselves as we go along. It's like a like a visual memoir, every self-portrait we do. What were we thinking about um, in our lives, but also what were we thinking about artistically? You know, like some of these um, artists are maybe new to you, you know, check them out. Um, we, all, we all are influenced by, by artists that we see. And, um, you know, for a while I was really interested in Kathy Kowitz, still am, um, did some self-portraits like her. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll try drawing my foot. I've been drawing a lot of feet lately. Um, you know, so, so it's like, you know, it's a little record of what you're thinking about personally, the environment that you're in, and what you're thinking about artistically. What's interesting to you in terms of format, in terms of design, in terms of color, um, in terms of lighting and flatness and modernity or, or reaching back to a, a tradition. Um, and then once we finish, we can share it with everybody and and we contribute a little bit to the, the cultural dialogue. 